I'll take you through right from the colonial days up to the present and see if I can squeeze it all in in about, looks like about 40 minutes, okay? This is, and again, I assume some of you out there are stamp collectors or were stamp collectors. And yeah. if you're of a certain age, there's certain, these stamps, uh, I think many of them will, will uh, recognize and so. But this is just a nice series the post office put out indicating all the, the amount of uh, involvement of people in, uh, in delivering uh, a simple letter. And of course, uh, with the pandemic and the COVID uh, virus, uh, we have essential workers and certainly the uh, post office uh, clerks, deliverers are all uh, essential workers and they've been working every day right through the, uh, right through the pandemic. Not only collect countries, but they collect topics on countries and uh, about 10 or 15, I think about 15 countries now have issued a special postage stamp dealing with the uh, virus and the COVID, you can see that one on the left from Bosnia. But I think the funniest one is the one below. It's a stamp made out of toilet paper. Uh, and the elephant is uh, one meter long. So if you took uh, three of three or four of these stamps and spread it between people, you'd, have, you'd be at the proper uh, distance. But Austria actually has done a number of stamps made out of different material. They made one out of a soccer ball material when the World Cup was going on. Uh, these are a couple of more, uh, one there from Iran with the doctors, one from Vietnam, and then uh, maybe you're not familiar with the country of Helvetia, which is actually Switzerland, uh, but they speak oh. four languages in Switzerland, so they went back to the old Roman uh, name for that area, Helvetia, so that's a uh, Swedish thing. A little quickly, uh, Joyce mentioned the museum, we're down at Regis College, probably about a 40 minute ride from you folks. It was founded by a Cardinal Spellman in 1960. He was a very important uh, member of the Catholic Church, not only here in America, but in Rome and became a Cardinal in 1946. He studied to be a, a, a Cardinal when he went to uh, Rome and that's where he picked up the stamp collecting habit. And then during uh, World War II, he was the vicar for all the Catholic uh, chaplains in the army and he literally traveled the world visiting them all uh, for spiritual uh, support. And uh, by doing that, he amassed himself a pretty good stamp collection. And then uh, on 1963, on May 4th, uh, on his birthday, the museum opened at Regis College. There were about a thousand people there, uh, the postmaster general. It was quite a big deal because there weren't any other stamp museums in the country. And even today, we like to tell people there are only two real stamp museums. Us, we're a nonprofit, a private museum, and the one down in Washington, D.C., which is much bigger and supported by the government, uh, the Smithsonian Postal Museum. But if you ever get a chance to get to Washington, you certainly uh, should visit that museum. We're a lot closer, and so once we finally open, we don't know when, we certainly want you to come, and maybe, uh, Joyce, you can arrange for a, a field trip for the group. Uh, like the Cardinal, well-known around the uh, uh, and although he's not on an American stamp, he did, when he visited uh, Central America, uh, they put him on one of their stamps. All right, we'll get into a little quick um, history of the, uh, of the museum, uh, I'm sorry, of the postal system. I uh, do a program, uh, I, done, I did a couple in um, New Hampshire, and so I had to keep these slides on, but uh, there are over a hundred stamps related to Massachusetts. We could do a whole program just on Massachusetts stamps. The other thing I like about stamps is you learn kind of real trivia pieces. This is Ogden Nash, who for some reason is buried in Northampton, New Hampshire. Why, I haven't figured out, but. Um, but I, so when I like to do these programs, I like to tie into the town I'm in and I try to make some connection. So I looked up uh, Newberry and Newberry Port and found out that the John Quincy Adams, our sixth right. president, lived in Newberry Port for a year. And Rufus King, who uh, was born, I believe, up in Maine, but came, when he became a lawyer, he moved to a Newburyport, and he actually signed, uh, was one of the signers of the Constitution. Uh, interestingly, as I mentioned, John Quincy Adams was the sixth president, and you easily know that because you'll notice he's on a six cent stamp. <laughs> Back in the 30s, if you collected stamps, the way you learned your presidents was by the denomination. So George Washington was on the one cent, uh, John Adams on the two, Abraham Lincoln on the 16th stamp. So it's just another way of, uh, of learning uh, history. 
if any of you else have any Newberry or Newberry Board connections to stamps, I would be more than happy to hear about them. Uh, back up into New Hampshire just for a minute. This is the oldest continuous post office in the United States up in Hinsdale, uh, still in operation all the way back to 1816, just shortly after the Constitution. Uh, the smallest post office is said to be in Ochopee, Florida. It's only 61 square feet, and it's down in the Everglades. And that's the smallest one. Uh, there's some other interesting post offices around. This is a post office out in Oregon called Bridal Veil, vale, uh, Oregon. Uh, there's really nobody in the town, but they've kept the post office open because they have a special cancellation, and they cancel thousands of marriage uh, invitations from there. You send them your invitations with, with a stamp on it, they put a special cancellation and mail it out. So it's a popular place to do that. People do that this for uh, Christmas as well. It's about 10 uh, towns or cities uh, in the country that have special uh, connection with the name Christmas. There's Christmas Indiana, there's Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. If you send your Christmas cards to them, they will put a special uh, cancellation on it. And here's the Bethlehem, New Hampshire one. Uh, you can see, and sometimes they have special ones. And then there's one more called Loveland. There's two Lovelands, one's in Missouri and one's in Colorado. And again, you send your Valentine Day cards and they will give it a special, well, you'll see those women in red, those are volunteers putting on the thousands of uh, cancellations. The post office, as I mentioned at the beginning, is uh, in financial uh, problems. That's why it's been in the news. Uh, it's, it's a semi private uh, company. It's not completely private. It doesn't get any taxpayer money unless it's getting loans, but it's, it's hurting now uh, because of a pension rule. Uh, this cartoon I thought was a, a little humorous. He says, sorry, we no longer have forever stamps. We now have just taking it day by day. But I must say the post office seems to have done a very good job with all the mail-in ballots, and I haven't seen too many news stories that complaining about what the post office did. But they are in red ink, and they have been asking Congress for money as a loan. Uh, Congress is not as receptive. There are at least a number of people in Congress who would like the post office to be completely private, somewhat like uh, United Parcel or FedEx. And uh, that's an interesting question that's going to be debated uh, for a few more years. And uh, this is another, you know, the old expression about neither snow nor rain nor heat would deter the, post, um, the postman, but if they lose their money, uh, that might certainly put an end to some of the services. But if you uh, order anything from Amazon, just to check to see, many, many Amazon packages are, are done by the US Post Office. And if you're a cartoon fan, this is another takeoff on that uh, uh, saying. Uh, this is a, a very a common cartoon character. And if you look at that stamp on the bottom, uh, every few weeks, Dagwood, as he's running out of the house, always runs into the poor mailman. Uh, so, but it even made it on a series of stamps about uh, famous uh, Sunday cartoons. And that expression uh, comes from the Greek, uh, from a book uh, written by Herodotus on the Persian Wars, explaining the uh, messages between the Greeks and the Persians and who was winning it. And if you uh, are a New Yorker, or you've certainly been to New York, one of the biggest post offices in the country is down in uh, uh, Madison Square Garden area, 34th Street, and it was a huge building built in 1912. And the official, unofficial motto is inscribed at the top of, uh, of that building. And coincidentally, it's the same architects who designed the Boston Public Library. But if you travel to big cities uh, and the old post offices are still there, they were very huge buildings because there was a uh, many, many letters being sent and a lot of work had to be done. There is a little controversy going on with murals that are in uh, post offices, murals that were done during the uh, Works Projects Administration during the Depression. You may be familiar giving artists some work. Many of the artists who are out of work, they hired them to do murals for uh, over a thousand post offices. But about 12 of them now are somewhat controversial and they've been covered up mainly because they deal either with treatment of Native Americans or with slavery. And so they've been asked, and uh, there's one actually over, I believe it's in uh, Medford that's covered up. Uh, there were five of these murals in post offices in uh, New Hampshire, and in, uh, in Massachusetts, there's about 35 murals. 
I don't believe I didn't find one in the Newberry and Newberry port, but I did find one in Rockport. That's the one on the on the right. The title is Preparing Granite. Danvers, with that man Timothy Pickering, who I uh, understand uh, worked with the Constitution, and then Ipswich, nearby neighbor of yours. Uh, Pickering was a postmaster general, uh, and uh, got a mural there. So, and then uh, many famous people have uh, worked for the post office, and many of them have been featured on stamps. And so these are just some of the people, including Abraham Lincoln, Charles Lindbergh, uh, Walt Disney, all had a time, probably when they were younger, working on the uh, post office. And I just put together a few of the stamps of people who could put on their resume that they at one time either worked behind the counter or delivered mail or did something for the post office. Uh, this, uh, just a, Start. We have a, an exhibit at the museum was prepared just before uh, we, we had to shut down, but celebrating the uh, Mayflower. This is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. And when we open, we hope that uh, people can come and see uh, this exhibit. But I put this in only because date-wise, the Pilgrims arrived in 1620, the Puritans 10 years later in Boston, and then just a few years later in Boston, uh, the Fairbanks Tavern became a post office in a sense. It's usually down, considered please. the first post office in, uh, in the United States or in the colonies. And it was right down near Quincy Market, which the Quincy Market is today. And basically it was a place for when the ships would come in from uh, Europe and if they had any map, uh, map uh, letters, they would uh, post them at this uh, uh, tavern and then hopefully people would come uh, looking for their mail. And then down in New York, uh, which is a little bigger than Boston. Uh, in 1673, uh, they started thinking about delivering mail between Boston and uh, New York and then down to Philadelphia. And uh, in 1645 was the first attempt at this, but then the official opening of the Boston Post Road would have been in 1673. And the Boston Post Road, as I think uh, you're familiar, well, let me do this slide. Uh, it was open for a little while and then we had several uh, wars with the Native Americans and it stopped. But then in 1707, uh, the British crown took over the post office in the colonies and made it that only, that's only the uh, official British uh, post office could deliver the mail. And here's a map. There are actually three old Boston Post roads. The one that's very near our museum is Route 20 that goes out to uh, Springfield. There's a middle route and then uh, what we uh, know today is US Route 1 uh, is the other Boston Post Road. They all met in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and then together they went down, all the way down to the Battery. But if you go into uh, the Bronx, there's still the Boston Post Road is still is a road there in the Bronx. And these are just a few uh, books. It's a popular uh, subject. And it was not called the Post Road, it was called the King's Highway. And then eventually it wound itself all the way down to Georgia. The man in charge of that after 1753 was Ben Franklin. Most people know him as our first uh, postmaster. He actually shared the job with another gentleman. He had uh, everything from Virginia through Canada, and then the other gentleman had the Southern colonies. But so Franklin was technically in charge of uh, post offices in Canada as well. He, got, he fell out with the British with a few things he shouldn't have done and they fired him. Uh, but while he was doing the job, he visited all 13 colonies this is kind of an artist's depiction of what it might have looked like in his visits, staying at the various inns. Uh, but he was very an uh, intelligent, efficient man. And uh, since in those days, they, you paid your postage by the distance that the letter had to travel, uh, Franklin came up with this odometer that attached to the back of a coach and said how far they'd gone. The other way they could determine their miles was milestones that were placed all along every mile. Uh, they were done usually by, this one's a little crude, but there were some fancier ones that were done by uh, the, the people who did the gravestones. And they were placed and uh, he helped uh, lay them down. And there's still a number of them that you can see either right on the road or in museums. The other thing that uh, Franklin did, his, uh, I think either his brother or his cousin was a whaler down in uh, Nantucket. And he knew about the Gulf Stream that when the ships were able to use to go faster. And he informed the British post office about this and mail got to go to England a lot faster. And that was because of Franklin. 
And then after when the revolution was just about ready to start and the Continental Congress was meeting down in uh, Philadelphia, they appointed Franklin as our first postmaster. And of course, since the, the colonists didn't want their mail intercepted by the British, they formed their own post office. And the most important thing for the post office was newspapers. Uh, that's the way people uh, learn their uh, rate. And if you were a printer, uh, you got to very often you ran the post office because it was a cheap way to send your uh, paper. And in fact, it's always been newspapers have been sent either for free or uh, rather uh, just at a very low cost. So he was named the postmaster in 75. And then Samuel Osgood became our first American postmaster in uh, 1792. Uh, coaches weren't really used on the Boston Post Rail before uh, the revolution. It was mainly just a rider having to go on the old Indian paths, having to wait for a ferry to take him across uh, the river as they headed down to New York. But after, uh, after the revolution, they started uh, with coaches. This is a, a more modern coach, but it's uh, uh, one of the coaches that was probably built in Concord, New Hampshire. The Articles of Confederation did have a post office. It wasn't really efficient. So then when the Constitution met and the delegates realized how important communication was in their new country, they actually put the const in the Constitution the establishment of the, uh, of the post office. And uh, Samuel Osgood, as I said, uh, took over. And then there were several other first postmasters. But they began with about 75 post offices with 2,400 uh, miles of road. But that was the job of Congress, was to set up the post office and the post road. And to this day, that's why the post office delivers mail to everybody anywhere in the country. Then as our country started to expand, going out into the Northwest Territory, which was Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. And then when we got the Louisiana Purchase, we started expanding further. There was a great need for a delivery of mail and uh, the number of post roads uh, really increased uh, every year. So it was quite important. And then as the territory, here's a nice stamp celebrating the state of, of uh, Kentucky. And uh, not only did they use the carriages and horses, but any river <coughs> big enough for a steamboat uh, would be hired by the post office uh, to deliver mail. And uh, there was a little, like today, there were controversies. Uh, 1836, anti-slavery um, uh, literature was being sent to the South, and the Southern postmasters did not want to deliver this incendiary literature. So there was a big battle. Did the postmaster have a right to not deliver it? And it never really got settled, but Andrew Jackson was the president at the time. All right, stamps. Uh, old letters didn't, don't have stamps on them. If you uh, go to your historical society and ask for an envelope from uh, 1800, you won't see a stamp because stamps weren't invented until 1840. And they were invented not here in the United States, but in Great Britain. And there's a picture of the first stamp. It's Queen Victoria. It's called the One Penny Black. Sold for a penny very cheaply. You could send your letter anywhere you wanted in Great Britain. Uh, and this post office took off. Before stamps, I don't know if I just mentioned, but when you sent a letter, the person getting the letter had to pay, which wasn't how you can think of a very good system. The stamp on the right, by the way, is Roland Hill, who's given credit for inventing the stamp. So this is what an old letter would have looked like. And the other thing that's missing is the no street number or street name. There's, little enough mail that uh, they, you were picking it up at the post office anyway, so they didn't need your street address. Then a fellow named Daniel Webster, who was in Congress, he heard about uh, the stamps over in uh, England. The post office in America was not making money. So he said, why don't we have stamps too? But it took him seven years before we had our first stamps. <laughs> and we charged by the distance, 300 miles cost you five cents. Over that was 10 cents. And these are the first two American stamps. A few years later, they changed the rule like it is today. You can send your letter in Newburyport. You can send it to Newbury for 55 cents. You can send it to Honolulu, Hawaii for 55 cents. And now every country in the world has stamps. We, uh, if you can go to the post office now, the, the stamp obviously doesn't say 55 cents. It says forever, which means you buy the stamp today, save it for 10 years. You don't have to put any extra stamps on your letter. 
The first forever stamps were in 2001, almost 20 years ago. And then of course, self-adhesive stamps came about. The first ones were way back in the 70s. But they didn't work too well. So it took a few more years before we had self-adhesive stamps. One funny thing is when our kids come to our museum, we teach them how to address a postcard because many of them don't know how to do that. And we always give them an old stamp and they're very confused because they try to just push the stamp and peel the back and we say, no, 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 you have to lick the stamp. And this little girl is just telling us that <laughs> she had to lick the stamp. And you can get in a little trouble licking stamps. And stamps are not just used by collectors, but sometimes by decorators. And this gentleman decided to decorate his whole car with stamps. <gasps> and there are other stories about people wallpapering their, their bedroom with stamps and other decorations. <laughs> Uh, the other thing the post office does, it tries to raise money for different charities. And this was the first of a semi-postal stamp raised for family violence. Uh, and you may have bought some of these. These are, there's the breast cancer has raised over $91 million for uh, cancer research. Some of the other stamps raising money to save vanishing species for Alzheimer's disease. And then raise the one on the bottom there is the raising of the flag at the World Trade Center. And that raised a lot of money for the victims of that attack. And then other countries have followed the same way to, uh, to raise a little extra money for charity. Okay, getting back to delivering of the mail. Uh, in 1848, as you know, gold was discovered in California and many, many people went out there and they wanted to get their mail. So the first way that that mail got there on land was this overland express that went from St. Louis, Missouri, all the way down through Arizona and then up to Los Angeles and San Francisco, and that was done by a carrier. But that was rather slow. Uh, the other way you could get mail to uh, California, if you left Boston, you wouldn't have to go around Cape, uh, of, of, uh, Cape Horn down in uh, South America. You could take and land in uh, one side of Panama, put your uh, mail on a donkey, go across the, uh, um, the hills there in Panama, take it to the other side on the Pacific Ocean and get on another ship and take it out. But again, this could still take two, three months. So as you're all familiar with, the Pony Express came about. And the Pony Express didn't come about till uh, 11, 12 years after gold was discovered, but it was a very quick way to get uh, information. And if this was, the Civil War was just about to break out and people in California wanted to know what was happening with the war. There was some talk that they might even secede and become their own country. So the Pony Express could get a letter from St. Joseph, Missouri, which you can see on that stamp, out to Sacramento in about 15 days. Uh, wow. It didn't last very long because the telegraph had already been invented and uh, they started putting the telegraph lines right from Missouri through the Rocky Mountains. In fact, near the end of the Pony Express, they could actually see the telegraph lines going up. And that stamp there is a Samuel Morse, uh, the inventor of, uh, of the telegraph. Interestingly, that's a two cent stamp that's red because back in the 40s and 50s, all two cent stamps were red. It, it helped the uh, post office know if you had enough postage or not. And then in uh, 1863, with the Civil War going on and many people having to go to the post office to find out how their news from the army, or if their son or uh, husband or somebody in the family was, had been wounded or killed, uh, but you'd have to go and stand in a long line to get your mail. So the post office decided to, uh, if the town had more than 50,000 residents, I guess 50,000 missing is zero that I just noticed, um, then you could get your mail delivered to your home. Uh, and that solved Ooh. a lot of the problems of women, especially opening up a letter and finding out some bad news. And then if you know the mail-in ballots was an issue here in this current election, as we all, all know, well, back in the Civil War, the soldiers could vote. They were either given a mail-in ballot or since, since they were all organized by the same state, it made it a little easier. And if there wasn't a post office around, they were actually sent home to vote. But many, many of the soldiers, and some people say that gave uh, Abraham Lincoln his victory because again, they voted for the commander in chief. The Confederacy, when it seceded, was no longer part of the post office. So they had to set up their own post office uh, and they put Jefferson Davis, the president on a stamp. And that gentleman on the right is the South the Confederate uh, postmaster. And then right just after the Civil War, although mail had been carried on 
trains as early as the 1830s, the mail wasn't sorted on the trains. And then some of the mailmen had an idea, why don't we not only just carry the mail and bring it to post offices in town, why don't we actually sort it on the train? And so that's what happened. And they were sorting mail on the trains until uh, the late 70s. And um, it was a very uh, challenging job. You had to pass a very strict test because you had to sort that mail rather quickly in rather difficult circumstances with trains rumbling back and back and forth. But that was basically how mail got uh, uh, delivered for uh, almost uh, 80, 80, 90 years. Ooh. And then of course, uh, when the uh, railroad was completed in Promontory Point, Utah in 1869, even more mail could get out to the uh, uh, West Coast. And then the penny postcard came around. We like to call it the original tweet. It only put so many letters on it. And uh, these postcards were issued uh, with a message uh, on the back uh, or information on the back. And these were very uh, profitable. And then picture postcards came about in 1907. And again, collecting postcards is quite a popular hobby. And then there was the, uh, whoops, not the dear letter office, that's a typo, the dead letter office. These were letters people the post offices couldn't read. So way back even in 1825, actually Ben Franklin even tried this, they worked uh, to decipher it because it's illegal to open the mail. So, but they hired mostly women uh, because they thought they were more honest. They wouldn't take out anything valuable that might be in, in the letter. Now we call it the mail recovery center. And eventually if they can't figure out anything, even after opening the letter, they will destroy it. And any valuables in the mail are auctioned off. This is a nice photograph I found probably around the turn of the century, maybe a little earlier. And this is the dead letter office. And you can see it's just about all the women working there. Uh, then if you want to send a letter overseas, it was costing you more because we didn't have any agreement with other countries that they would deliver our mail. So in the 1870s, uh, Montgomery Blair, actually a, a little earlier, had proposed some kind of international agreement that brought about the Universal Postal Union. And that makes all the rules for mailing uh, all around the world. Basically, we'll, we'll deliver mail if you'll deliver our mail. And it's still in effect today. Then uh, another in, important thing for the post office was the delivery of the Christmas cards. And around 1874, a fellow out in Worcester, Louis Prang, uh, started making very popular um, Christmas cards. And it carries over even to this day. And uh, a couple of Sundays ago, Parade Magazine, if any of you still read that, claimed there were over 1.17 billion Christmas cards delivered in 2019. And then of course, mail order, uh, the, pack the post office did not deliver big packages. They delivered catalogs, uh, but you then had to ship it on private uh, companies. Uh, then special delivery uh, came about. It was an extra amount, but it could get the letter the same day. And you can see the, it usually was two cents for a regular mail, but stick a special delivery on it and you get it 10 cents. That's in the 1880s. And then a man named John Wanamaker, and if you recognize that name, his name was most well known for uh, department stores in Philadelphia, but he was appointed by Benjamin Harrison, as you can see our 24th president. And uh, he in, did a lot of innovations using his uh, business skills. And he came up uh, with the idea of parcel post. And in 1913, the post office started uh, delivering uh, packages. And these are all the different, these, Nice, they're nice stamps, but they didn't last long because they were all the same color. And of course, there were different charges for different parcel posts. So they did away with these stamps and did other stamps. And this brought about uh, not only uh, the packages, but as I mentioned, only people in the cities got their mail. But in, in the 1890s, Wanamaker introduced rural free delivery. It took about 20 years for it to complete. But by the uh, early 1900s or so, almost everybody was getting mail delivered to their house, even way out in the, in the country. Um, and you could deliver not, a, not just mail, but you could deliver all sorts of things, uh, little baby chicks. In fact, uh, you folks aren't too far from Essex. And there was the Hardy uh, farm up there that raised chickens for many years. And they would send out their baby chicks in the mail. And then uh, housewife or farmer's wives to make a little extra money could mail uh, eggs and they would fill up one of these aluminum containers, take it down to the train station and it would get delivered a few towns down and then it would be sent back and you'd use it again. This is only two dozen, but they had them as big as 15 dozen. 
And bees, you can still get bees today. You don't get all the bees, you just get the queen bees. But those can be uh, sent uh, live in the mail. And uh, in old days, not so much now, but as uh, young uh, men, mostly men, went away to college, they would send their laundry back to, uh, to their house, mostly their mom, ask them to do the laundry. And these are special laundry suitcases. You put the postage and the address on, and then it would come back to you after it was all neatly uh, ironed. And even people were mailed for a short amount of time. This is a children's book, a famous story about a little girl in Idaho who couldn't visit her grandmother because her father couldn't afford the train ticket, but she heard that they were delivering packages. So she went down with her father to the uh, post office at the railroad station, and there weren't any rules that you couldn't mail a little girl. So for much cheaper than a train ticket, she got mailed to her grandmother. The post <laughs> office changed, changed that uh, a couple of years later. Uh, there's some other stories of people mailing themselves. Uh, the post office uh, was a segregated uh, agency for a number of years. Uh, and there were some rather horrendous stories about things that would happen to uh, black uh, postmasters. Uh, this one is a woman named Minnie Cox, who uh, was a, there are no postmistresses, even a woman is a postmaster, uh, but she was uh, hounded out of her uh, post office by the local people didn't want her dealing with their mail. Uh, so Teddy Roosevelt heard about it and he closed that post office for a, a year and those people had to go about 30 miles to the, to the next post office. But there are even some stories in the books about the lynching of some postmasters there. So. And then because they were segregated, the postal workers and um, the employment at the post office was a very good position for African-Americans at that time but they were denied membership in the regular union. So they formed their own African-American union. And I put this uh, picture of Frederick Douglass, who you, I'm sure you're familiar with. At his funeral, 10 of the members of the union actually were pallbearers there. But it was Woodrow Wilson who segregated uh, the post office. Then oh. uh, for a little while in about six cities, uh, there was underground mail. And if you're familiar with pneumatic tubes, uh, you could, uh, uh, deliver a letter and it would be put in these tubes to different places in a city and the mail could be delivered uh, several times in a day. One of those tubes could hold about 600 letters. So it was a little uh, bit of a construction, but it lasted uh, 20 or 30 years for that. And then of course in 18, uh, 1918, airmail came about. And this of course uh, is a famous stamp. If anybody knows anything about stamps, they usually come to the museum and say, do you have that uh, famous upside down airplane, which was a, a printing era. There's only 100 of them and they, the last one was just sold at auction for about a million dollars. But uh, it was a strange printing thing. And for some reason, stamp collectors really liked this stamp, even though there were other stamps that were printed wrong and didn't become as popular. Uh, and then it, it, we've you know, you heard about the uh, president calling in the uh, troops to quell some issues. There was a lot of robbery going on in the 1920s. And so they actually had to call the Marines in to guard the uh, mail trains. And so that solved the problem after a little while. Uh, and then uh, as I mentioned, you can get mail at your house, but by 1923, you had, you had to have a mailbox either out front of your house or some slot in your, in your house. And uh, it used to be the mailbox actually had to be approved by the Postmaster General. Uh, the post office uh, takes some criticism, but interestingly, the Hope Diamond uh, in the 1950s, the very a million dollar plus uh, diamond was actually sent to the Smithsonian uh, just by mail. All the oh. stickers are the insurance, but they trusted the post office to deliver this very valuable diamond. And then back to airmail, since there wasn't any radar yet in the radios, these were towers that were built uh, all across the country. And next to the tower was an arrow telling the pilot which way to go. Because the pilots, if they had a map, it might not be that helpful. They usually followed the railroad tracks. Uh, but that, that towers and so still, there aren't too many of those towers left, but you can go out west and find a number of those arrows. And then, of course, Charles Lindbergh, the famous uh, Lucky Lindy, uh, he uh, was a, worked for the uh, post office for a while and greatly encouraged uh, the use of, uh, of airmail. And since uh, Joyce has a cat. She'll notice the little black cat on the, the stamp there. This, according to stamp collectors, is the first postage stamp to have a cat on it. 
And Lindbergh was asked, supposedly, was he going to take his cat with him? And he said, oh, no, no, very far too dangerous to take a cat. There was something people don't always surprise when we tell them about this at the museum, and that's catapult mail. Uh, before uh, planes could actually travel over across the ocean, uh, even after Lindbergh, uh, they would put a plane on the back of a, a passenger ship. And when they got about 400 miles from uh, New York or uh, maybe down, down the coast, uh, they would shoot off the plane and it would bring the mail maybe a day, even two days ahead of time, because speed has always been an issue with the post office. This didn't last too long, but uh, envelopes that carried uh, these letters are very valuable to collectors. And then of course there were street mailboxes, going back a little bit. Uh, they were invented in the 1850s. This is an example of one. Uh, they were then four-legged boxes. Uh, funny little thing, uh, they were olive green for a while. We still have olive green mailboxes, but that's only to store mail. But uh, the reason they were olive green was they had extra paint from the army. Then they made them red, white, and blue in 1955. And then in 1971, the, the post box we're most familiar with now, the, the blue box. So these are just an example of some of them. And then if you go into any a big office building or nice hotel, these mail chutes are very popular. And they're not used anymore. They're considered fire hazards, but it was certainly an easy way to get your letter from the 20th floor down to the mail room. And you may remember these old blue mailboxes that were just attached to a post. Uh, I don't think you can find any more of these because they didn't hold that much mail. And then during the protest about the mail-in ballots, we found this picture of some dancing mailboxes in uh, Philadelphia when they were trying to count the, uh, the ballots. But you can see the, the stamp there encouraging uh, the voting booth. And now <clears throat> in some places, mail is being, people are trying to steal mail from mailboxes. They call it fishing for mail. And uh, they have these kind of fishing poles and they will stick a hook down there and see what they can carry out, hopefully looking for uh, checks mostly. So a lot of mailboxes, I know in uh, Cambridge and in Boston, there's a new mailbox. You don't pull the lever down anymore. You just slip your, your letter yeah. in. That was designed to check some of this uh, stuff. And boxes are disappearing. I'm not sure if any of your neighborhoods no longer have a mailbox. It might have been there 15, 20 years ago. The post office has a policy that they like to get at least 25 letters a day in a mailbox. And if that doesn't happen over a period of time, they will remove the mailbox. So if you want, if you have a neighborhood mailbox and you want to keep it, make sure you're uh, using it as much as, as possible. Uh, the post office also served as a bank for many years. Uh, some of you might remember these uh, little saving stamps. Uh, you could get them in school. You bring in a dime once a week. Your teacher would give you a 10 cent stamp. You'd put it in a booklet. And then uh, when the booklet got filled, you could turn it in for a, uh, for a savings bond. It was another way that the bank, unfortunately, uh, the, bank, uh, the banks were not too crazy with the post office being a bank. And so while you go to Europe, many European countries Post offices serve as banks, not in this country. The other way of doing mail uh, <clears throat> in the cities, they had these trolley cars that would travel and they were actually traveling post offices and they could cancel over 200 letters per hour and the mailman would deliver it from the, from the trolley and the stamp collectors like to collect letters that were canceled on these. I'll skip this fellow here. And then in 1941, they decided to replace the trolleys with the postal buses since it was the start of the war. It didn't actually take on until after the war. Uh, and then this is an interesting story that Social Security, when Social Security was passed, they didn't know how to get cards to people. They didn't have any organization. So who do you go to? You go to the post office. And so the post office was responsible for getting out all the Social Security uh, cards. And there were about 45,000 local post offices were the ones responsible. And that uh, woman there, I think her name is Mary Fuller, she lived to be 100, so she got a, quite a few secu security checks, but she's the first woman in America to receive the first social security check. Then in World War II, since it was difficult to send full letters and planes over to Europe and to the Pacific, they have what was called V-mail. And basically you'd write a letter, it would be photographed on microfilm, sent over, and then they'd take another picture of it and you'd get a small letter and that was called V-mail. And it was a way of getting mail to a soldier. Because mail next to uh, food and ammunition <clears throat> was the most important uh, part. And actually, there, there was actually a miniature Time magazine that was sent. This is an example of one. And I just found the Sinclair Lewis because 
That's who's featured on the front. But these are tiny magazines with no advertising. And then of course, uh, getting letters from your wife and your girlfriend uh, was very, very important. And of course, censorship had to be considered. All letters were checked that the soldiers weren't giving away any location information. And then there were some abbreviations, SWAK sealed with a kiss, which you, many uh, girlfriends would sign their letters to their boyfriends. Uh, and then of course, with so many men at war, more and more women were hired uh, to deliver the mail. Uh, and just uh, some of you, I'm sure you're familiar with the movie Miracle on 34th Street, in which it proved, they used the post office to prove that there was a Santa Claus. If you remember that scene, uh, John Payne is a lawyer trying to defend Chris Crinkle, and he gets all the letters to Santa that the post office had delivered to the judge. And he says I... to the judge, well, the post office says this man, Santa Claus, he must be. And, he's closed. and it's just kind of a, a fun, fun scene. There were some uh, unsuccessful ways of delivering the mail. They tried in the late 50s to send rocket ships uh, to make it even faster. Uh, unfortunately, many of the rockets crashed, and so rocket mail was not as successful as some other other things, but the more primitive ones up in Alaska, delivering mail by dog sled, and you can see one on the latest Alaska stamp is an example of it. And they might even use reindeer. Down in the, in the Arizona, they used camels for a while to uh, deliver mail. And if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, there are people living at the bottom of the canyon, one of the Indian tribes, and three times a week, uh, mail is put on the mules and carried down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. U UPS and uh, FedEx and the others will not deliver down to the bottom, but the post office does. And then in uh, uh, things, the post office getting busier and busier, so they started automating as much as possible. And the first automated post office was nearby down in, uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, then in 1963, zip code came in to make things go faster. Zip code means zone improvement plan. And there was a lot of publicity about it. And Ethel Merman, one of the famous Broadway singers, did, I guess, a number of publicity songs to uh, get the word out that you had to use your uh, zip code. And then in 1969, uh, the post office was really in trouble. Uh, they just getting piled more and more uh, mail. And so there was, this is actually a Life magazine where they, uh, the reporters sent letters from all over from different cities to see how long it would take the letter to get there and published kind of an expose on the post office. The other trouble was the mail carriers were being paid very, very small. So by 1970, they actually decided to strike and started in New York City, spread to some other, other cities. And then it was resolved, uh, but it was resolved by reorganizing the post office. President Nixon uh, signed the order, making it a semi-independent agency, which is what I mentioned at the beginning of the program. So he signs the order and now these, they're not working for the government anymore they're working for the post office. Uh, the trouble is in, 19, in 2006, more legislation was passed that said the post office had to put in its budget money for future pensions. And most countries don't do that. Most of the government doesn't do that. But this making, forcing the post office to put money away made it impossible to balance the books. And that's basically the problem that's facing uh, the post office today. In addition to uh, the fact that emails certainly have reduced the amount. In fact, there were about 700,000 workers in 2000, and now it's about 500,000 postal workers. So, so there has been a decrease uh, because of email, and, uh, but they still, as I said, mentioned like uh, package delivery. And junk mail, even though we don't like getting it necessarily, is still uh, bigger. In fact, I met, there was a, a wife who came to a museum, and her husband was a post carrier, letter carrier, and she said he sends away for catalogs just to keep himself uh, in business. So, so that's basically a quick uh, tour of the history of the uh, post office. Uh, if you have any particular questions, I'm happy to answer them now, but this is our email address. And um, we also have a website and we've just put up a, we have two tours, two virtual tours on our website, one of the gallery. And then we're also not only celebrating the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower, we're also celebrating uh, the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And so we have a nice exhibit. And if you want to click on our uh, website, it's about a 10 minute tour of the exhibit. And I think you'll uh, find it interesting. So 
And then uh, put this on, I forgot this was still on here, but uh, even though there was no Macy's Day Parade, I got out the old stamps celebrating uh, Macy's Day. So, so that's the program, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, Joyce, do you want to figure out how we can do questions here? Uh, well, uh, yes, let's, well, I actually, Susan needs to do that. Am I oh. unmuted? Pardon me? S Susan? Right. You want to use the chat room? Or? Yeah, everybody needs to unmute themselves if they oh. want to speak. Okay. If anybody um, has a question. Oh, I know I went rather quickly. I was trying to get everything in in the no. 20 minutes. Joyce, um, does anybody have a question? Or you can use the chat room. How many, uh, you have just one post office in uh, Newberry and one in Newburyport, or there are two? Is it just one, uh, one post office in each, each town? People need to unmute themselves. Um, we have two post office buildings. The, there's in the, in the business park, there's a second, uh, I don't know exactly what the function of that other building is. They do a lot of, I think they do a lot of sorting right. there. But Newberry does have a, a, a separate post office. Because mm -hmm. many towns used to have more than one. I know Weston used to have five post offices. Mm -hmm. in small mm -hmm. town. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question about the decision in 2006 to require the uh, future pension right. um, money. Was that an anti-post office move or what was the reason for that move? Uh, many people think so. I mean, as I said, and, and it's mostly Republicans, but they would like to, to see the post office completely private. And I think some people thought that was a way of uh, kind of hurting it. Now, other countries have tried it. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit New Zealand a few years ago. And they actually had two mailboxes on the street, one for the government mail and then one a private company that would deliver your mail. And England wow. has been trying. So it's not just here in the United States, but with the decrease in mail delivery, uh, private uh, carriers are necessary. Hmm. Henry, so did, did, did you say, Henry, that uh, Woodrow Wilson segregated the post office or desegregated? No, he segregated it. Yeah. yeah remember, he's, I don't know if you remember a few, a couple of months ago, it was, there was a lot of controversy over a statue of him down at uh, Princeton. Oh. This is a uh, segregation of the whole government. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he does his, his uh, legacy among uh, in segregation is not is not the best but uh, but again even today i believe that almost 50 percent of post office employees are minorities uh, so it's a good it's a very good job uh, and uh, you know as long as you don't have to go out in the snow every day i guess but, <laughs> but wilson uh, wilson was not uh, uh, as a southerner he, he brought about that segregation unfortunately Thank you. Yeah, uh, Henry, excuse me. Henry, here's a question from uh, Steve Newman. He said, what percentage of stamps are used for postage today? I believe almost all are printed for collectors and dealers. What does the post office do for, for the extras? Well, well I, I think that's the Steve I know. I know he's a collector. Uh, oh. <laughs> my, my understanding is that after a year, stamps that aren't sold are destroyed. Really? Okay. Uh, some post offices will keep stamps longer than others. Sometimes you go in, these days they only get delivered a certain amount. And if it's a popular stamp, uh, sometimes it runs out rather quickly. They also don't print as many stamps as they used to. In the 50s, they might print 400 million, 500 million stamps. Today, some of the commemorative stamps are only, I think the, the Mr. Rogers stamp that came out of a year and a half ago, which I thought was going to be a very popular stamp. They only printed 20 million of those. So uh, that, of course, adds to their value uh, if you're a collector. Um, and again, you can print your own stamps now. You can put your own picture on it. Remember, remember the other rule is you have to be dead to be on a postage stamp, an American stamp. <laughs> there, are no there are no living people uh, officially on, uh, on stamps. Mm -hmm. Some, 
there's a little twist. I mean, for example, the man on the moon stamp. And some people claim that's uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, but it's not. It's just a stamp commemorating the landing on the moon. And mm -hmm. some people like to, we had a woman who came to the museum who was the model for one of the uh, Olympic stamps, even though she doesn't get credit as being on a stamp. So you have models and stuff. But back to Steve's question, yeah, it's a, they're, they are stored, I believe there's a kind of a storage place in Kansas, but I, I don't think they keep all the stamps forever. When I was growing up in New York, you could go to that big post office and get old stamps. I do remember that. Uh, but I'm, my understanding is that uh, they pretty much destroy these. Mm -hmm. um, Henry, I Henry? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, this is Steve Newman. I think yes, I can see you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, is there published information of how many of these stamps they have uh, issued and retained? Oh, that don't get sold? Uh, I'd have to do a little research on that. That's a good question. I'd have to. That do get sold. Well, they do get sold. Well, it depends on uh, on the topic. You know, uh, uh, some stamps just aren't attractive and people don't want them. Sometimes there's controversies of the people on a stamp. Uh, you know, Harvey Milk uh, stamp, uh, the first gay mayor of San Francisco. Some people didn't want to buy stamps with his picture on it. Frida, Frida Kahlo was considered a communist, so people didn't want to buy her stamp. But you know the so, most popular stamp ever sold. So they don't tell you anywhere uh, after the stamps are issued years after how many were actually, they actually got sold? I'm sure they know that because there are occasions, not so much in the United States, but sometimes a used stamp is more valuable than a mint stamp. Wow. But, uh, but the most popular stamp was the Elvis Presley stamp. But in oh. the post office, we sold more of those and most of those didn't get used because people uh, kept them. Really? Yeah, I imagine the, other, Kennedy, the Kennedy stamp must have been pretty popular as well. The Kennedy stamp is an interesting one because usually stamps are only issued in one town. Uh, usually in the president's case is where the president was born. And then the next day they're sold all over the, the country. But because yeah. the stamp was so close to Kennedy's death, the post office shipped the uh, Kennedy stamp to all the post offices at the same time. And so people bought the stamp the first day. In fact, it's called the first day cover, but there are people who collect all the different cancellations. I, I collect those. Do they have a record of how many first day covers were? The last, the last figure I saw, where there were like, there were like four thousand out there. I think we have a book at the museum that lists that. But uh, I think people collect those. Yeah. yeah. Um, Henry, um, it seems to me. Why did they do the forever stamps? It seems to me they lose money on the forever stamps. Yeah, people say that. Uh, on the flip side, uh, they were hoping it would, it would be a you know quick way of getting some money, uh, getting yeah. the income now uh, rather than uh, you know spreading it out over that. That that was one of the only reasons. Plus, it uh, bookkeeping wise, I think it's it's easier for them as well. Uh, most yeah. The the other thing too is that uh, unfortunately stamps have lost their value that some people say the value now is only to use it as postage. And the, when they started with the forever stamps, they were 40, was it 44 cents, I think, or 42 cents? Yeah, I think in, that, in the 40s, yeah. Now they're 55 cents, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it was, I think it was partly, and it was convenience too. You do save some money because you don't have to print up two and three cent stamps. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you ever watch the movie Fargo, if you watch the movie uh, Fargo, uh, there's a funny scene at the end about the uh, extra, extra postage. Yeah. yeah. All right, I gotta get going. Thank you. This has been very informative. Right, thank you. I'm glad you. I'm Your glad you could join. Thanks. So very timely. <laughs> how how you feeling these days? You okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing good. I I can hardly wait for you guys and every <laughs> to uh, get their vaccine and uh, get get to go to the museum again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, good to see you. Any other questions? Henry, a question. If the um, post office would privatize, what do you think would be the changes? I, I know that's a little out of your expertise, but well, no, one, of, one, of the, one of the reasons, you know, even, even Saturday delivery has been a debate 
you know, mm -hmm. for years they want to cut down on Saturday delivery because that costs money. But there's always the complaint that uh, uh, you know, people need, people get their medicines on Saturday, and there are other things. So, and then the other thing, Congress, even though Congress says, why don't you close some more post offices? Nobody likes to close a post office. It's like, no. closing, it's like closing an elementary school. So okay. you announce a post office is going to close, and then people come out and protest, and even though it may cost more money to run that post office. So, uh, but no, I, I, I think there'll always be a, well, in fact, interestingly, legally, uh, if you have a legal document, it has to have a cancellation on it. You can't use a date on an email to prove that you've done something by a certain date. So, mm. no, I, I don't, and there's now some people say, well, why do we, why do we make stamps? Why do we save a lot of money? John McCain, for example, uh, every senator, I think, gets a, first day cover every time and John story I read was he just wrote back to the post office save money I don't want so uh, but uh, but you know again I'm Amazon delivering millions of packages and so yeah it's I, I doubt that it'll disappear there may be in different forms and some some hours and there may you know some people say you could deliver mail every other day and it wouldn't make that big a big difference so hmm. Keep, stay tuned. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. So any other questions? Um, Henry, you wanted to know how many people were here? Yeah, what, what's our crowd today? Um, let's see if we can do this. Who is left? Um, your friend left, right? And um, Henry, your friend left? Yes, he did, I think. Okay, so there are how many of us? Um, one, two, well, it says there are 10, and then was, and then, um, I don't know, Donna and Bill were on two separate things. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, nine or so, 10 people? Yeah, I think 11. And then that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be happy to uh, come back in the spring if we're still closed, if you want to do. Yeah. Well, program. thank you very well, much. This is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Good holiday. Okay. Bye. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yep. Good yes. Christmas. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, yeah. everybody else. And Bye. goodbye, Bye. Henry. Bye. Thank you so much. Good Bye. night. Bye. 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 Hi, George. Hi, Susan. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Now I got. Oh, Susan, I didn't see that you were on. Was I didn't <laughs> me? See Have you been on the whole time? Me? Yeah. Of course. No, no, Susan, yeah, and Bar. I yeah, saw her. She yeah, was can, lying down. I can see your cat. <laughs> I know. I know. He loves this chair when I watch this, you know.